Hello and welcome to the MyHeritage webinar series. I'm Miriam Pierre-Louis, your host, broadcasting to you live from Eastern Massachusetts. Today we have Shahar Tenenbaum, who is with us live in Israel for his class, Identifying Common Ancestors with DNA. Thanks to Shahar and thanks to the more than 2,200 of you for registering for today's live webinar. So wherever and whenever you are, glad to have you with us. And now to introduce our speaker. Shahar Tenenbaum is a quality assurance automation engineer in the DNA team at MyHeritage. He has a BA in cognitive science and, a psych and psychology from Ben Gurion University. Please put your virtual hands together and let's give Shahar a nice warm webinar welcome. Shahar, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure, and we're looking forward to this topic today. I'm going to switch over to your screen. Looks perfect. The time is all yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be uh, today. We're going to be discussing the topic of uh, how to identify common ancestors using DNA. My heritage offers a wide variety of tools to help you do just that. Some are more easy to use, and some require a bit more understanding of how DNA and DNA matches work. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, you will be able to use all of them in your genealogical research. So what are we going to be covering today? We're going to start with the basics of DNA, which is essential to identifying our common ancestors and using all the wonderful tools I'm going to be talking about. Uh, from there, we'll delve into the world of DNA within my heritage where we'll discuss DNA matches and all the extra information we can get from the review match page, shared matches, uh, the new and immensely helpful DNA labels, chromosome browser, autoclusters, and lastly, we'll explain what theories of family relativity are, how we can use them, and also when you can expect new theories. So without further ado, let's start with the basics. What is DNA? DNA is the building instructions of our body. It exists in every cell and is what sets us apart from one another while maintaining the things that make us human. Every person in the world has their own unique DNA. The building blocks of DNA are four types of chemical bases, commonly referred to as A, G, C, and T. Bases come in pairs called base pairs and are often referred to as SNPs of which we have over 3 billion in our genome. A string of consecutive bases is what is called a segment. Uh, in this example, the T in the red box would be a base, the AT in the yellow box are a base pair or a SNP, and the string in the pink box, TCAA, that would be a segment. If we zoom out a bit from individual SNPs, we'll see that together they form chromosomes. We have a total of 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 are called autosomal and are present for both males and females, and one pair of sex chromosomes, XX for females and XY for males. The reason we have a pair of each chromosome is that we inherit one strand, as it's called, from each parent. If we use the image from the previous slide, we can see that each base pair, which is comprised of two bases, takes one of those bases from the strand received from one parent and the other base from the strand received from the other parent. So if we go back, uh, we can see that the A in the yellow box, uh, we can say that it comes from uh, our male parent, for example, and the T would come from our female parent. Now, when discussing things like DNA matches and hereditary genetics, we usually use percentages to explain how similar our DNA is to the other person. We say, for example, that a parent shares 50% of their DNA with their children. And we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk more about what that means in just a minute. But in reality, all people share around 99% of their DNA with each other, which is what sets us apart as a species. That's why we have arms, legs, a head, internal organs, uh, fairly similar facial structure, etc. We differ in about 1% of our DNA, and that single percent is what differentiates us as individuals, creating a wonderfully interesting and diverse population. So if I say that I share 50% of my DNA with my father, that means that I share 50% of the 
of that 1% that differentiates us. So we actually share 99.5%. But when talking about DNA matches and hereditary genetics in general, uh, we would call that 50%. Now, I just said that I share 50% of my DNA with my father. But what does that actually mean? As we've seen, we inherit one strand of DNA from each parent per each chromosome to a total of 23, including the sex chromosome. Now let's try and understand what that strand contains. Let's use an example. Here we have a pair of parents, Frank and Molly, and their child, Ben. Uh, for simplicity, let's talk about a single chromosome pair, chromosome one, for example. Each parent has two strands for that chromosome, one from each of their parents. Frank has the dark purple, which he inherited from his male parent, and the light purple, which he inherited from his female parent. Molly has the dark orange from her male parent and the light orange from her female parent. When Ben was conceived, he inherited half of Frank's DNA and half of Molly's, one strand from each. However, as you can see, we don't inherit an exact copy of one of our parents' strands, but rather a mix of what they received from their parents. That's why Ben has one strand that is a combination of dark and light purple and one that is a combination of dark and light orange. Each jump from dark to light and vice versa is called a recombination event. And it happens a lot of times when the child is conceived. It's an important event that helps uh, keep our DNA diverse and is the reason we share DNA with all of our grandparents. Let's take a look at Ben's spiritual strand, the one he inherited from his father. We see it starts with a dark purple segment and then switches to a light purple one. That switch is a, is a recombination event. So the first part we can say that comes from his father's father, his paternal grandfather, and the second part, the light purple, comes from his uh, paternal grandmother, his father's mother. On Ben's orange strand, inherited from his mother, we see it starts with dark orange, jumps to light orange, and then back to dark orange. So here we have two recombination events, a segment from his maternal grandfather, then one from his maternal grandmother, and back to the grandfather. In reality, we have many, many more of these events across all 22 autosomal chromosomes, and that is how we inherit DNA from our parents. Okay, now that we've covered what DNA is, um, let's look at how we can use it in our genealogical research. Most importantly, DNA matches. In short, DNA matches are individuals with whom we share a sizable portion of our DNA. As we've mentioned before, we're talking about a sizable portion of those 1% that are different between individuals. In order to identify DNA matches, we need to see how much of an overlap they have with our DNA, with long enough segments that could indicate there is a shared ancestor with that individual. Jumping back to our example of Frank and Molly, uh, they now have another child, Lisa, who is Ben's sister. Looking at the representation of chromosome one of each of them shows that they are very similar. They have the same colors, but they are not exactly the same because 100% similarity happens only for identical twins. In order to figure out if these two individuals are DNA matches, we need to find how much of their DNA overlaps and how long are the overlapping segments. If we look at the comparison chart on the right, we can see that there are overlapping segments in the DNA. Being siblings, we expect them to share around 50% of the DNA, which is exactly what we see here. Let's look at Ben and Lisa's first strand, the one they inherited from Frank, and the top strand in the comparison chart. Both Ben and Lisa start with a dark purple segment inherited from Frank's father, their grandfather, which is why we see an overlap in the comparison chart. Then, Lisa jumps to the light purple segment inherited from Frank's mother, her grandmother, before Ben does, which is why we have a gap. Then there's a recombination event on Ben's strand and he switches to light purple, which is why we have another shared segment. And then Lisa jumps back to dark purple, which is why we have a gap at the end of the strand. Uh, so we can see that the overlap of Ben and Lisa's DNA on the strand inherited from Frank covers DNA from both uh, Frank's father and his mother. 
And we can say pretty much the same thing about the strand from, uh, received from Molly. Taking another step further down the line, we've now added another generation to our little family tree. Eric, the offspring of Ben and his partner, and Julia, the offspring of Lisa and her partner. We can see that each of those new partners introduced a whole new set of genetic data represented by the color blue for Eric and the color green for Julia. Those are strands Eric and Julia inherited from Ben's partner and Lisa's partner respectively, and are completely different from what Ben and Lisa inherited from their parents, uh, which is exactly what we expect. However, if we look at the top strand for Eric and Julia, we can see that they hold the genetic data, the segments they received from Ben and Lisa. We can see uh, in the new comparison chart on the right that the overlap degraded from what we saw for Ben and Lisa, and the overlap is only on one strand, the one received from Ben and Lisa, and is now around 12.5%, uh, which indicates that they are indeed first cousins. And that is exactly how DNA matches work. The further two individuals are from their common ancestor, the smaller the overlap and the overall match. So to sum it all up, in order to identify DNA matches, we look for segments that overlapped in the two individuals we're examining. And if those overlapping parts are substantial, <clears throat> sorry, substantial enough, we can calculate the shared DNA percentage. And that helps us identify where that individual should appear in our family tree and who the common ancestor is. Now, let's see what tools and additional information MyHeritage can give you on your DNA matches, and we'll start with the Matches Overview page or the DNA Matches page. This is usually the first stop when starting to explore DNA matches on MyHeritage. Uh, here you can see all of your DNA matches, each in their own personal match card, who are, and those individuals are comprised of users who took MyHeritage DNA tests, as well as individuals who uploaded the, the results from other vendors. Uh, the matches list can sometimes appear endless, with thousands upon thousands of DNA matches, which is why we have various ways we can filter and sort our matches list. Uh, myself, for example, I have close to 20,000 DNA matches, and while that can be a bit, can, can seem a bit too much, uh, using the filters we can narrow it down uh, to help us um, have a more organized uh, research. Under the tree details menu, you can choose to filter matches that have theories of family relativity, uh, individuals with smart matches, shared surnames, shared places, and individuals that at least have a family tree. Under relationships, we can filter matches based on the closeness of our relationship, with close family being relationships that are between immediate family through first cousins. Extended family includes first cousins once removed through second cousins. Uh, once removed, and distant relatives start with third cousins and goes on from there. Filtering by locations allows you to filter matches that are listed in a specific country. Filtering by ethnicities allows you to find matches that are part of a certain ethnicity, uh, one of any of the 42 that MyHeritage supports, whether you are part of it or not. Similarly, you can filter your matches by any of the 2100 plus genetic groups that MyHeritage supports. And lastly, we can filter matches based on the DNA labels we assign to them, as well as the matches marked as favorites. Uh, and we'll talk more about DNA labels uh, in just a few minutes. This is a multi-choice filter, so you can filter based on several labels, and matches will appear if they are part of at least one of those labels. Now, all of these filters can work together, so you can choose to filter by any combination of these filters. And finally, we can also change the order of the matches in the list. Uh, by default, we show them ordered by the shared DNA percentage, but we can also order them by amount of shared segments, the length of the larger segment, uh, alphabetically, or by how recently they were discovered. Jumping back to the match cards, there is a lot of information you can use here, uh, even at a quick glance. Uh, the name, the approximate age and location of the match, as well as a photo if one is provided, and the option of contacting that match. You also have an estimation of the relationship based on the percentage of shared DNA, as well as the length of our shared DNA in centimorgans, 
which is the unit of measurement for DNA, and the number and length of the shared segments, which are also displayed. Uh, we also have an overview of the shared genealogical data, including information about that individual's tree, shared ancestral surnames, information about smart matches with that individual's tree, and common ancestral places. Uh, we also have the label strip on the left, which shows us the DNA labels we've assigned to that match, and also an indicator if that match is marked as a favorite match, and also a checkbox that allows us to manage the DNA labels of that match. Uh, but again, more on that later. In addition, we have the notes indicator, which shows us if we've already written notes about that match and allows us to create new notes uh, that are private only to us and are not shared with that match. So any information that you've gained on that match, if you've done your research already, if there are any points you want to um, keep written down, you don't have to memorize it, you don't have to keep it by heart, just put it down in the notes and you'll have access to it later. Lastly, the match card is a gateway for further research. We can click on View Tree to see that matches family tree, or click on Review DNA Match and get a deeper dive into that matches shared genealogical and genetic data. Once we click on the Review DNA Match button, we are taken to the Review DNA Match page. This is a drill down page on a specific match and contains quite a lot of information, starting with the match card, which contains the same information as what we saw in the matches overview page. Uh, we also have uh, smart matches between our tree and the matches family tree. An extended list of shared ancestral surnames. Uh, it's always a great place to look for clues regarding uh, the shared ancestor. And shared ancestral places, an easy and intuitive place to look for further clues. We also have the pedigree charts. It's a visual depiction of your and your matches family trees, starting with you and the match as the roots and expanding to see each other's ancestors. Uh, it's a fantastic visual tool to try and locate those ancestors in your own tree. Lastly, we have shared ethnicities and genetic groups. Uh, we didn't delve into the whole ethnicities and genetic groups feature as it's not directly related to identifying common ancestors, but this is a good way to identify close matches or to put the nail in the coffin for a match that you were not 100% about because ethnicities and genetic groups rely on specific segments in your DNA. And finding shared ethnicities and genetic groups could be a good indicator that there is a common ancestor just behind the corner. Now, I know that it feels like I'm rushing a bit with all of these features. And honestly, I could easily fill an entire webinar with only the features we talked about so far. But useful as they are, they are there are several other, other more in-depth tools at your disposal that I would rather expand on. Starting with another component that sits in the review match page, shared DNA matches. What are shared DNA matches? Simply put, these are individuals which both you and the DNA match you're currently exploring have a DNA match with. Uh, let's look at the first entry in this list, Miss Ender. On the left, you can see that I have a match with her, calculated to be 1.4%, as well as the length of shared DNA, 96.7 centimorgans. On the right, you can see that Israel, my father, has a 2.3% match with her, which translates to 164.5 centimorgans. Uh, you can also see the estimated relationships for both myself and my father, uh, second cousin to third cousin once removed for me, compared to first cousin twice removed to second cousin once removed for my father. We also see the DNA labels that I assigned to her, whether or not I marked her as a favorite match, a link to her family tree if she has one, as well as an indication to any notes I may have written about her. Additionally, by hovering over the triangulation icon on the right, we can see how many triangulated segments the three of us share. Triangulated segments are DNA segments that are shared by all three of us, ourselves, the DNA match we're currently investigating, and the shared DNA match. What makes this such a powerful tool? Well, it can be used to extrapolate your understanding of one individual to a whole host of shared matches with that one individual. For example, it's very useful to know 
whether a certain match is paternal or maternal. And using this tool, I can know, I can know just that. Since my father is a confirmed match, meaning I know who he is and I know 100% that he is my father, um, I know that all the DNA matches that we share, all of our shared matches are maternal as well. Since my father is a confirmed match. Now, similarly, I have matches that are not shared with my father and I know that they are maternal because if they're not shared with my father, they must come from my, uh, my mother's family line. Now, paternal and maternal are one thing, but you can use the same logic for any other confirmed match that you have. Any shared matches with your maternal grandfather, for example, mean they must come from his family line and that he or one of his ancestors are the common ancestors with the match you're investigating. Shared matches with confirmed cousins, uncles and aunts, any grandparent, this can all help you pinpoint that individual to a certain region of your family tree. And thus to the common ancestor. We've recently made this tool even more useful by introducing one of our latest additions to the shared matches component, and that is DNA labels. Uh, now, DNA labels, we've mentioned them a few times already. They can be used for filtering matches, they're seen in the review match page, and also for shared DNA matches. But what are they, how do we use them, and why? DNA labels are a relatively new tool that lets you organize your DNA matches using custom color-coded labels, uh, which can help you gain more insights about your DNA matches and potentially break through some genealogical brick walls. Let's jump back to the matches overview page and check out one of the match cards. As we've mentioned before, on the left, we have the labels strip. In there, we see the favorite indicator. Simply click on it to mark a match as a favorite. Following that, we have the label indicators. Uh, they indicate the labels that I have already assigned to that match. If I hover over one of the labels, we'll see the name of the label so we can yeah, be easily reminded of what each label means. To assign labels, click on the checkbox for one or more of the matches that you want to work on. That will open the label manager panel. Here you can see all the labels you've already created, edit existing labels and create new ones. You can have up to 30 different color coded labels. Each match can be assigned to as many of them as you want, even all 30 and there's no limit on how many matches can be associated with a certain label. To create a new label, simply click the Create New Label button at the bottom of the panel, and that will open the label creation pop-up. Uh, here you can choose a name and color for your new label. You can use them in any number of ways, uh, by ancestral surnames, family lines, shared surnames, uh, if they are paternal or maternal, if, um, if they uh, share a certain uh, DNA segment, and the list goes on and on. Once you chose the name and color, click Save, and the label will be added to that list. And there you go, a new label we added and is ready for use. To add it to a match, simply make sure the match is selected. As you can see, my father Israel is selected, and click Apply. And the match was assigned to that new label. You can perform bulk actions for labels. You can select multiple matches and assign or unassign labels to them together. And you can also assign and unassign uh, a bunch of labels in one go. You don't need to add them one at a time. Now, as we've mentioned before, once you start associating matches with labels, you can use the labels to filter your DNA matches list to help you be more organized and precise in your research. So we've seen how the labels can help organize our DNA matches research, but it can do more. Let's go back to the review match page, scroll all the way down to the shared matches component. Remember that we said that we can extrapolate our understanding of a certain match uh, to our shared matches? Well, now we don't need to have each and every match memorized or have our known connections stored somewhere else to make uh, future research complicated. We now have a color-coded, custom labels to help us out. You can use information you know about the current match and apply it to all shared matches. In this example, I can already mark all of these matches as paternal uh, if I have a label that indicates it. If this was a match that's even further away from me, like a cousin or a second cousin, then the shared ancestor will likely be at least 
my grandfather or great grandfather. This is a huge help when trying to figure out their place in my family tree and identifying our common ancestor. Of course, this works both ways. If I start investigating a new DNA match and I see that a lot of our shared matches are associated with the same label, this could indicate that this new match is also part of that group. It could be a certain family line, it could be a chromosome uh, that we have a shared segment on, uh, family in a specific area, etc., etc. Assigning labels from the shared matches component is very similar to doing it from the matches overview page. Simply select one or more of the shared matches and add, edit, or remove labels. Another cool thing about labels is that you can create a different set of labels for each DNA kit you manage, which makes the labels suit each and every DNA kit you manage perfectly. Uh, we have plans to expand the use of labels even further to other features, um, for example, by adding them to the chromosome browser. Speaking of the chromosome browser, this is another hugely helpful tool that appears in my heritage in two forms. The first is shared segment, uh, segment, sorry, which is a component on the review match page, and chromosome browser one to many, that is a separate tool which we'll discuss shortly. Now, I'm sure you're all very excited. Finally, there's a payoff to that whole what is DNA section we've gone over. The shared segments component shows you all the places where you and your DNA match share DNA, where our genetic code overlaps. The purple parts are shared segments and the gray parts are areas that are not shared between us. And the shared DNA segments will probably pass down to us, uh, to the both of us, from our common ancestor. Clicking on any of the shared segments will open a helpful tool, uh, tooltip, sorry, that will tell us which chromosome that shared, match, uh, shared segment is on, its exact genomic position, uh, the range of RSIDs it covers, its size in centimorgans, and the number of SNP it encompasses. How does that help us? Well, first, the more we know and understand about our DNA matches and about our genetic genealogy, the better our research will be. If we can find the common ancestor that passed each section to us uh, and our DNA match, we can use that information on other matches as well. Because if they share the same segment in the same location with us, then they are probably also related to that same ancestor. So how do we identify individuals that share exact segments with us and another DNA match in a way that can help us make use of that information? For that, we call upon the second form of the chromosome browser, one to many. We can access it uh, in one of two ways, either by clicking the triangulated segment icon in the shared matches component on the review match page, or by going to the DNA tools page from the DNA menu and opening the chromosome browser from there. And then we get to the chromosome browser. This nifty tool allows us to find triangulated segments between ourselves or someone else whose kit we manage and between one and seven of our DNA matches. As we mentioned before, a triangulated segment means that the segment is shared by at least three individuals and likely comes from a common ancestor we all share. Uh, as an example, let's call on our family from earlier and use the comparison between Eric and Julia's DNA. All three colored segments in the comparison chart on the right are shared segments between the two of them. Let's focus on the shared purple segment. If we added Ben to the comparison, that segment would still be shared by all three individuals because Eric and Julia, as well as Ben, inherited that part from Frank. That would be a triangulated segment shared by more than two people, and that helps us identify the common ancestor. In this case, it's Frank. Now let's get back to the chromosome browser. By clicking on any of the matches in the list, we can add them to the comparison. So once we click compare, we can see a comparison of the shared segments between ourselves and each of the DNA matches we selected. The red line indicates a shared match between myself and Israel, my father. The orange represents my shared segments with Mr. Lapek, and the yellow represents my shared segments with Miss Lands. As you can see, the four of us have only one triangulated segment, 
uh, the one marked with a frame on the left side of chromosome 3. That is a strong indicator that all four of us share a common ancestor. And further use of this tool in conjunction with other tools we've mentioned will allow us to pinpoint the common ancestor and find where all of these individuals fit in our tree. Uh, there are several other segments that seem like they could be triangulated. Uh, for example, on the far right of chromosome one, chromosome 1. While I do have a shared segment with each of these individuals in that area, it's not shared between all four of us, possibly because the shared segments are on different strands. As we see, we have a strand inherited from our father and one inherited from our mother. Uh, so for example, I could be sharing the strand uh, with my father, it could be one strand, and the shared segment I have with Mr. Lapek and Miss Lance could be on the other strand, which is why we are not triangulated. Okay, so until now, we've mainly talked about how we can extract information from a single match or a small group of matches using information available in the review of match page, shared matches, shared segments, and the chromosome browser. Now, I want to talk about how we can use a massive amount of matches together uh, to help us learn new things that we did not know before about our genealogy. And of course, I'm talking about uh, the sometimes misunderstood behemoth, that is the autoclusters report. Uh, it basically groups together our DNA matches into clusters that can together help us figure out common ancestors and family lines. To get to the autoclusters page, simply open the DNA menu and click DNA tools. From there, click on the explore button on the autoclusters card. Once we get to the autoclusters page, all we need to do is select the kit we want to generate a report for and click generate. This process takes some time, but after a few minutes, you should get an email with the autoclusters report. Once it's ready, you can download it and open the attached files. And what you'll see is this lovely image. Uh, it's not very helpful or informative, but once you give it a couple of seconds, the magic will start to happen and the report will create groups or clusters of shared DNA matches. Something that looks like this. But what are we seeing here? Each cluster shows us a group or cluster of DNA matches that are all of them or most of them are shared matches with one another and are not shared matches with other individuals that are not in this cluster. Let me explain. Uh, do you remember we saw the shared matches segment uh, of the review match page? Well, this report runs through all of your matches and clusters together groups of matches that are shared between them, but not shared with other individuals in other clusters. This usually signifies a shared common ancestor. Uh, the X and Y axes are identical. They contain the names of individuals that are my DNA matches, and each square, be it colored or gray, represent the match between those two individuals. Colored means they are a match, and light gray means they are not. So as you can see, uh, all of the blocks, all of the boxes in the diagonal line, uh, they are always colored because those are each person having a match with themselves, uh, which obviously that always happens. And then the other boxes may be colored and may not be colored. And those are indication, indications of whether or not they are matches. Uh, while this is indeed a pretty report to look at, let's zoom in a bit to see what information we actually have here. Here we can see the first cluster more clearly. In the diagram on the left, we see two individuals who are my DNA matches. When we cross their paths, we see that there is a colored box. That means that they are DNA matches of one another. On the right, we see that the cross between the individuals comes out as gray meaning they are not matches of one another. Why do they appear in the same cluster then? Well, that's because both of them have enough matches with other individuals in the cluster to justify it. It's all about finding groups of matches that work well together. Zooming back out again, we see that in addition to the colored and light gray boxes, there are also dark gray boxes. Uh, this indicates that these two individuals are indeed DNA matches of one another. 
but they belong in different clusters. Uh, when we see a larger group of such cases, where we have the dark gray boxes indicating individuals who are matches of one another, but do not belong in the same cluster, uh, that could indicate that if we would have had a few more matches uh, in that group or between these two clusters, then these clusters could, could have been joined together into a larger cluster. The reason this helps us even beyond what we can find out using shared matches is that sometimes shared matches are a bit too general. Let's take another look at the matches I share with my father. I can safely say that all of these matches are paternal matches stemming from somewhere up my father's family line. But if I were to remove my father from this equation, I would probably see a breakdown of these matches into two groups, one group or cluster from my paternal grandfather and one from my paternal grandmother because my matches with my grandfather probably don't match with my matches from my grandmother because they come from separate family lines. This is exactly what the auto cluster report does. It shows us groups of shared matches that probably share a common ancestor. Now, all of these tools so far, um, they can help you find that elusive common ancestor, uh, but they do require some more genealogical work. They don't provide you the common ancestor on a silver platter. However, uh, the last tool I want to talk about today, well, sort of does. This is, of course, theory of family relativity. As you may recall, uh, for each match uh, that we have, we give an estimated relationship between yourself and that match. And it usually comes as a range of options. Uh, first cousin twice removed to second cousin once removed, for example. What we try to do with theory of family relativity is narrow down that range into a single option and show you how we got to that suggestion. Theories can be found in the matches overview page, the review match page, and in their own unique theories page. To calculate these theories, we rely on all the gene genealogical data we have at MyHeritage, family lines, uh, family trees, sorry, historical records, DNA matches, smart matches, record matches, and so on, to create a cohesive path between you and your DNA match. That means that even if your tree doesn't have enough information, we use all the trees in my heritage and all the different matches and records and a whole lot more technology and data to find how the two of you are linked. Let's get back to our theory. In this theory, we are logged in as Roman, who is shown on the left and are seeing this theory in his review match, page, uh, review match page of Amelia. We have a theory that suggests that Roman is a second cousin once removed from Amelia. And we are also provided with a simple chart that shows us exactly how this theory suggests they're related. The common ancestors in this case are Alexander and Margaret, Roman's great-great-grandparents and Amelia's great-grandparents. But the thing is, Roman doesn't have Amelia in his tree. He doesn't even have Alexander and Margaret, the common ancestors. Amelia doesn't have them either. So how did we get to this theory and what connections lie beneath? Let's click on the view full theory button and see exactly how this theory came up. Now we see the entire path from Roman to Amelia and all the different jumps uh, we had to take in order to reach it. Let's start on Roman's end. We can see that in history, we have his mother and then his mother's father. It's possible that Roman only filled in his magic seven, which includes himself, his two parents, and his four grandparents, or it could be something else that made us stop here and make our first jump. In this case, a smart match between Roman's tree and another tree managed by Laura. Uh, we can see it's a smart match for Keep Solomon, Roman's grandfather, who also appears in Laura's tree. The date of birth and death of Keep are the same in both trees, and that's probably why we have uh, this smart match. And it's a strong one too. It's a 100% uh, match, well, according to us. But if you want to make sure, just click on the smart match, and you'll see all the information we have for that match. 
This side-by-side -side comparison lets you see all the information we have for that individual in both trees and could be very helpful in your own research. Uh, you may even look and decide that you don't agree with this match. That might happen because, as the name suggests, this is just a theory and relies heavily on the information people enter into the trees. And as we all know, sometimes we don't have the most accurate information, or sometimes we might be even completely off, which is why it's important to always check how the theory is built and what jumps it took. Now that we've reviewed that match, we can go back to the tree and explore further. We stopped in Laura's tree. There we have Kip's mother, and then her parents, Alexander and Margaret, the common ancestors in this theory. From there, we start going down towards Amelia. We have Alexander and Margaret's son, John, and then another jump, and it's a smart match again, to a family tree managed by Jacqueline. Go down one step, then another smart match, and then we are in Amelia's family tree for the final step in this theory. And this is how we theorize Roman and Amelia are related second cousins once removed with Alexander and Margaret as their common ancestors. We calculate new batches of theories every few months uh, as we gain more family trees, calculate new DNA matches, and upload more records. Uh, and I know there are people who've been anxiously awaiting uh, new theories, and I can tell you that a new batch of theories is coming out very, very soon. Uh, now, there can be more than one theory between any two matches. Uh, sometimes the trail can lead us in several different directions, and every theory can have more than a single possible path. So it's important to always check all theories and paths uh, so you can be sure that you have identified the correct common ancestor. And that is it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and managed to take away a few key points to use next time you sit down for some genealogical work. And thank you very much for listening. Shahar, that was great. So much information. Uh, I guess I'll switch over to my screen. Um, let's see here. One question for you, though, before I do the announcements. Um, one person asked here, oh, Zoe Ann wanted to know, where is the theories found? And I was scrambling about there at the end trying to find it. Okay, so the theories are found in three places. Okay. Well, first of all, not, not all of your DNA matches are going to have theories. Uh, it depends on how big your family tree is. And even if your family tree is very big, we can't guarantee to find uh, theories for all of your matches. But if you do have matches, well, first they will appear in the matches overview page. Okay, I'm gonna in put, the match card. I'm gonna put my thing oh, on the screen. So okay, okay, so the overview page. Right. The matches overview. Okay. Yeah. So click and, on DNA matches. Uh, so here. Ah, uh, yes, that's good as well. Okay. And if you scroll down a bit. Okay. I don't want to show my, my uh, for privacy reasons, I don't want to show my DNA matches. Where would I? Okay. Um, uh, would well, I... it would appear in one of the, one of the cards. As we see, oh. uh, we see GDE, who is yep. your father. Yep, that's my dad, yeah. Then if there was, um, if there was a theory, it would appear oh, over uh, here? in the same place. Uh, no, it would appear on the bottom. Oh. In the same place we see GDE appears in your family tree. Oh, okay. So that's um, so right here in this section. Exactly. Okay. So we would have another line that indicates uh, that there is a theory. Okay. And once you open the review match page, uh, you would have seen what I've shown before. Uh, if you want, you can go back to my uh, to my screen, and I'll show you again. Okay. Sure. Hang on. Let me move that over, and I just need to switch over to. If you can go ahead and get to that on your thing, and then I'll bring this up. Here we go. You'll see that alert now. Yes, I have it, yeah. Okay, so this component that you see on the screen right now, that would appear on your review match page. Uh, well, that would be the first component there. If you have a theory, then that would be the first thing you see when you open that matches review match page. And then the last place would be clicking on view full theory. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's over mm -hmm. that button. 
oh, there it is. Uh, and then you would get to the full theory page, and then you'll have all the information, all the theories, all the paths. Uh, that would be the most mm -hmm. in-depth place to explore that theory. So there's no way to just sort by the theories? Because I used to be able to get a list, then it showed uh, me. You can. Okay. You actually can. Uh, one of the, th of the filters that we have, and we mentioned okay. before, uh, it sits under the family tree. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's under the family tree uh, filter. And one of the options there is filtering by matches that have uh, theories. Okay, hang on. Uh, I am going to bring it back to my screen again. Okay. So that we can do this. I'm. Okay. So we're. So where do you want me to go for this? Uh, click on filters okay. on the right. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the left, there's tree details. Oh, tree details. Okay. Oh. Exactly. Okay. And the first option. Okay. So exactly. That would be but, how uh, you would bring up. Your list exactly. of, of theory of, of all the matches theory. that okay. we have a theory for. Okay. Exactly. All right. So DNA matches, then filters, then tree details, and then theory of family relativity. Okay. Great. Exactly. Wonderful. All right. Um, okay. So let me get rid of that. And all right, you can sit back for a moment or two, Shahar. I'm going to do um, some announcements and door prizes, and then we'll bring you back on for the Q&A, OK? So we have um, more webinars coming up, more MyHeritage webinars. On June 28th, we have top 10 secrets to using MyHeritage. That's with Daniel Horowitz. He's an absolute favorite around here. Uh, January, uh, July 12th, MyHeritage's latest photo innovations. Um, so that's very promising. I, they're always updating um, what they can do with the old photos, whether it's colorization or animation or um, what are the enhancements. And then on July 26, we have Exploring Your Ethnicities on MyHeritage, so we'll be going back to DNA at that point. All right, we have many MyHeritage webinars in the library. Um, these are available to you for free. So go to my uh, familytreewebinars.com forward slash myheritagewebinars, or you can just go to the search bar right on the front page and pop my heritage in there and it'll bring them all up as well. All right, door prize time. So if you're here right now, then you are able to win the door prize. And our first door prize is a one year My Heritage Complete plan. And this will give you. The Premium Plus Family Site Subscription, so that's all the family tree building aspects of MyHeritage and the online tree consistency checker, and you, it lets you contact other site managers. And then it also gives you a data subscription, so this gives you access to all of uh, the records at MyHeritage, so 16.3 billion historical records from all around the world, all different types. You can see down here all these different types of records. All right. I just need to pick. There's a lot of people here today. And the lucky winner of the one year My Heritage Complete plan is Ali Vakuri. So, Ali, you have won um, the My Heritage Complete plan. Congratulations. I will be sending you an email later about how you can get that. All right. Our second prize today is a My Heritage DNA test kit. And of course, how appropriate given our topic today. And with this, you'll be able to uh, check your ethnicity results, and you'll also be able to access all the information about DNA matches as Shahar has been talking about today. Uh, so this will be a great um, addition. And if you have tested your DNA already at uh, my heritage, of course, you'll want to give this to your next, next best target, you know, contact somebody whose DNA you need and, and see if they'll test for you. The winner of the DNA test kit is John Mills. So congratulations, John. I'll be in contact with you about that. All right, let's bring Shahar back on for the Q&A. Oh, Denise is saying, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm going to rewatch this webinar. So much information packed into this session. Yes, it was, Shahar did pack a lot in there. You covered a lot, Shahar. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I try to. Yeah. Uh, I hope people would be able to use that information as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Darylin is asking, is there a handout 
we don't typically have handouts for the My Heritage uh, webinars. No, there is no handout today. All right. Uh, Stephen wants to know uh, when sorting, can they be sorted alphabetically? The matches. I'm Stephen. I'm I'm assuming you're talking about the matches and not the the color coding. Um, uh, I assume so too, and yes, they can be, they can uh, be. as we've shown actually in the webinar before. Okay. Um, if you go to your DNA matches page, the one we just saw where we have the filters, we also on the far right, we have the sort by option. And one of the options there is full name, oh, yeah. and that's alphabetically. Okay, I'm just going to read what it says under sort by. We've got sort by shared DNA, shared segments largest segment, full name, and most recent. So those are all the options listed there that you can sort by. So great. There's actually, yeah, there's actually one more thing I, I just realized I forgot to say. You can also search for certain names. So if you're looking for a certain uh, last name or a certain um, shared surname and all that stuff, there's actually a button uh, just to the right of the sort by options. Mm -hmm. And that's the search, bu uh, the search button, and you can use it to search for uh, for the names and for all the other information we have there. And, and that's pulling from the family trees, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, okay great, excellent. All right, so let's see. Uh, Leslie says, um, when you're reviewing the matches and you click on the shared DNA, you only see a few matches and then you have to do this little button that says show more. She wants to know, is there any shortcut that will allow you to see all the shared matches without having to click those little buttons? Uh, well, yes, there is. You can actually, uh, download a list of your shared matches with any of your DNA matches. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head how to do it, but if I recall correctly, you need to go to your um, to your um, review match page for a certain match, scroll down to the shared matches component, and if I remember correctly, there should be a button there that allows you to download the list of all of your shared matches. Okay, I'm just clicking. My computer seems to be going a little slow right now. No way. Well, anyways, all right. So that sounds good. I don't know. My computer's not working. Oh, I would. Or otherwise, I would try that. All right. Um. Okay. Oh, uh, so Bev. So this is going back to a question we just answered. It's asked in a slightly different way. So I'm gonna. Uh, I'm just going to remind everyone what she just what we just said. So Bev's asking. Can you put uh, your shared matches in order of centimorgan size? And that was one of the sort buys, right? We've got largest segment. Well, we have, yeah. You know, it could be one of two things. It could mean uh, by the amount of total shared centimorgans, uh, which simply translates to the shared percentage of DNA. So that's what we have by default. Mm -hmm. And the second option is by the largest segment that you have, and that's also one of the options. Okay. So you can do it uh, either in either of those ways. And I'm sure that you can flip those, you know, go from ascending to descending or descending to ascending, you know. In, in um, second, actually. You know what? I'm not sure. I think you can't. I think it's only from, uh, it's only descending, I okay. think. But uh, it's a good question. I'll have to check. Yeah. No, I've, I just did it on my computer. It looks like it's descending. I don't see that you can change it yet. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ray wants to know, uh, do the estimated relationships generated by my heritage take endogamy, for example, Ashkenazi Jews into consideration? Um, if he's asking if we, you mean endogamy that's found in the fam, I don't know if he's meaning uh, endogamy in the family tree or general known endogamy, uh, such as the cases of, uh, of asking Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it does. I'm not 100% sure of that. I'll have to check. But I'm pretty sure that we do take that into consideration um, when making our model and creating our algorithms 
of how we calculate DNA matches, I think we take that into consideration. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, so Monique asked a question about filtering shared matches. We already talked about that. So Monique, the answer to your question is yes, you can filter your shared matches before labeling them. Michelle um, asks, how low a percentage match do you label as being in a family? Like sometimes the match is 0.07. Uh, well, 0.07 can still be um, a distant cousin of yours. Um, so basically, all of your all of the matches that we show can be part of your family, or probably part of your family. Uh, it's just a, a matter of uh, how up your tree would your common ancestor be. But all of your matches can be traced to a certain common ancestor at some point. Is, um, is there a cutoff? Have... Is there a cutoff figure for when uh, my heritage stops? You know what they'll show in the the DNA. Yes, matches? I think. Uh, let me just take a, uh, take a look for one second to see uh, if I have an accurate answer because I don't want to I don't want to just say something uh, that not, might not be correct. You know, I'm looking at my own um, matches list, and I can see we go down as far as 0.2%. Okay. So I assume that that might be the cutoff, 0.2% uh, or 12 centimorgans. I think that's the cutoff. Okay. Kay wants to know, will my heritage add X chromosome matching to the results? I know it's something that the science team uh, is looking at. They are uh, working on that to try and see if it's a viable option for us. I can't tell you yet uh, if it will be implemented or not. Okay. But I know that the science team is looking at all of these options uh, because they do want to give us uh, the, best, uh, the best options for matches. Okay. So uh, you, you'll have to stick around and see uh, yeah. what comes out of that. Yeah, so wait and see. That's the answer there. <laughs> exactly. um, um, let me see. Oh, okay. Uh, this is from Marla. She says, so I'm going to read this slowly. When they're long like this, it's a little harder for me to scan, and, and but I think we can answer this one. Using the chromosome browser, one to many, She's comparing six known relatives, including siblings, who are from the same paternal line. Uh, but there's not even one triangulated segment shown. Is that because I'm comparing too many individuals? That's Well, it could be. Um, it depends on the individuals. OK, it seems like she's, uh, well, there are six relatives number of them are siblings. We don't know who the other ones are. So yeah. Okay. All right, Marla, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I did the best job there in reading off your question, but um, we covered Zoan's question about the theory of relativity. Oh, and let's see here. Sandy is saying, answer to shared match limits. Uh, mine, go, hers go down to eight centimorgans slash 0.1%. So thank you, Sandy, for sharing that. And um, I'll just add here, Kirsten says least amount that she has uh, is eight centimorgans. So, oh, Victoria wants to know, how do you print out your matches? Is that even possible? To print out your matches? Yeah. Yes, it's very much possible. Oh, oh is that that uh, download thing? Do, yeah, exactly. You can do one of two things. You can either uh, download a list of all your DNA matches, and then they have a lot of the uh, genealogical information as well. Or you can export your shared DNA segments. Um, for each individual DNA match. So you can do one of those things. Okay. Both can be done from your uh, DNA matches page. So you go to DNA, you click DNA matches, where you have the list of all of your matches. And then on the top right corner, right next to the filters and sort by and search button, there's a three dot button, which has three options. Export DNA matches list, export share DNA segment info for DNA matches, and also a what are DNA matches, uh, if you want to go over that again. So both options are available for you. Okay. 
All right, question from Stephen. If you have your auto cluster files and your MyHeritage subscription ends, can you still view the results? Uh, can you ask that again, please? Sorry. Uh, so he's talking about auto cluster files. And so I so what you do is you put your request in right and then they send you a file which you download to your computer. But exactly. it's, it's an HTML file. I don't know if it connects back to MyHeritage when you view it or not. So he's asking if your MyHeritage subscription ends, can you still view those auto cluster files? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, once the file is downloaded, it's yours. You can use it whenever and as many times as you want. Uh, I don't even think... No, yeah, you just have uh, you just have access to it whenever you want. You won't lose it. Okay. Sheila is saying this isn't re really a question for you, but a suggestion: Would my heritage consider adding a search by triangulated segments on the shared match list? So that's a that's a very good question. Um, you mean adding a search or filter for a shared segment with a certain individual? Uh, um, it could be a good idea, actually. Uh, I'll take it and suggest it to our product team and see what they think. If, if people have suggestions, uh, what is the best way for, those, for them to share the suggestions? Uh, I think there's no way of contacting the DNA team directly, but what mm -hmm. you can do is you can either contact the support team or the sales team or maybe reach out on social media, uh, either Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, everywhere we are available and the teams there would be uh, very helpful in forwarding that message to us. So, f for instance, would the support team be support at myheritage.com? I think so, yes. All right, I'm going to just put that in the... Uh, one uh, gentleman was asking in the chat earlier about um, accessibility for the blind, and I, I gave him a phone number. So I'm going to just put this email address here, and anybody else who has suggestions at all for DNA or anything at MyHeritage, you can use that. Hopefully that email works. Somebody can test it. <laughs> uh, it works at Legacy, support at Legacy Family Tree, so it should work. <laughs> if, even if it doesn't, you can just go to my Heritage, and then we help the Health the help Center, yep. and you can use that, uh, either that or social media. Uh, that always works. All right, and I think this will be our last question for today. Uh, Leslie wants to know, can you transfer your DNA results from Ancestry DNA into my Heritage? Well, you can't transfer your, your matches on their own, but what you can do is download your uh, DNA kit from Ancestry and then upload it to MyHeritage. And you can do that absolutely free, and you will have access to some of the DNA features that we have, including the DNA matches list. Um, and then if you want to use all the, all the other features we've been talking about today, I think there's a one-time fee, um, which I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, it's, you will be able to use all of our features even if you upload a kit from another vendor. Okay, great. Well, Shahar, this has been a wonderful um, presentation. It was uh, uh, really good for me to try and follow along and, and, and go to all the things that you were doing. I know many people in the audience were trying to do the same. And a lot of people there looking forward to um, doing the replay and really kind of uh, going over it again in, in even more detail. So um, thank you for your time here today. It was greatly appreciated. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And once again, thank you for everyone who's been listening. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you all guys uh, again sometime. Yeah, hopefully we'll have another My Heritage Live soon. I know they're feeling people out about that right now. And thank you to our audience. We appreciate you being here, uh, and we hope to see you at the upcoming MyHeritage webinars. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.